Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is entitled, How to Interpret Scripture. Now, for any Christian group, that ought to be a major, major, very important subject. This particular lesson is entitled, Creation, Genesis as Foundation, Part 1. It's lesson number eight in our series from May 23 of 2020. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for your presence with us and especially for your word that has given us so much wonderful counsel and guidance and instruction for righteousness' sake. All through the Old Testament and the New Testament, we are thankful for every part of it. Guide us now as we discuss some of the earliest parts of Scripture. The implications of Genesis 1 and 2 are enormous. May we be able to grasp that in its full significance as far as possible is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 There are not many in our world today who believe the reliability and authenticity of the first 11 chapters of Genesis. This, of course, has arisen out of the ideas of evolution and Satan's attempts to discredit the scriptures and to sow doubts about God's word in every way he can. So how should Christians regard these first few chapters of Genesis? This is from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sabbath, uh, May 16. The first chapters of Genesis are foundational for the rest of Scripture. The major teachings or doctrines of the Bible have their source in these chapters. Here we find the nature of the Godhead working in harmony as the Father's Son uh, in John 1, 1 to 3, and Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, and the Spirit, Genesis 1 and uh, on chapter 1, verse 2, to create the world and all that is in it, culminating in humanity, Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Genesis also introduces us to the Sabbath, Genesis 2, 1 to 3, the origin of evil, Genesis 3, the Messiah and the plan of redemption, Genesis 3, 15, the worldwide universal flood, Genesis 6, chapter 6 through chapter 9, the Covenant, Genesis 1, 28, Genesis 2, 2 and 3, 15 to 17, Genesis 9, 9 to 17, and Genesis 15. The dispersal of languages and people, Genesis 10 and Genesis 11. And the genealogies that provide the framework for biblical chronology from creation to Adam, Genesis to Abraham. 5. Oh, Abraham. Creation to Abraham. Uh, Genesis 5 and Genesis 11. Finally, the power of God's spoken word, Genesis 1, 3, and 2 Timothy 3, 16, and John 17, 17. The nature of humanity, Genesis 1, 26 to 28. God's character, Matthew 10, 29 and 30. Marriage between a man and a woman, Genesis 1, 27 and 28. Genesis 2, 18. 25 to, uh, 21 to 25. Stewardship of the earth and its resources, Genesis 1, 26 to 15 and verse 19. And the promised hope of a new creation, Isaiah 65, 17, Isaiah 66, 22, Revelation 21, 1, are all based on these first chapters, which will be our study this week and next. Okay. Wow. That was a mouthful, wasn't it? So how are we supposed to understand those first few words of Genesis 1-1? That verse says, in the beginning. How long ago was the beginning? Well, Dionysius Exiguus, Latin for Dionysius, Dionysius the Humble, who lived from approximately 470 A.D. to approximately 4, 544 A.D. We don't even have very precise dates for that calculated that creation occurred in 4004 B.C. He started working on his calendar around 525 A.D. And you can read, if you want a brief history of that, in, in uh, Wikipedia under the, under the name Exiguous. However, that calendar was not fully adopted until Bede, and he was born somewhere um, 
in 672 or 3 and lived until 735, used Exiguus's calculations in his ecclesiastical history, which he completed in 731, and that should be A.D. Bede was also known as St. Bede, Venerable Bede, and Bede the Venerable, uh, Latin Bede Venerabilis. He, he was an English Benedictine monk at the monastery of St. Peter and later wrote the, the Ecclesiastical History of the English People, 731 A.D., which gained him the title the Father of English History. Note that some creationists believe that creation must have been earlier than 4004 BC, but of course evolutionists would suggest it began much earlier and has been billions of years in developing. And that you can look under BD in Wikipedia or any other reliable um, encyclopedia. The Septuagint would push it back another thousand years, yeah. but that's still yeah. uh, not what yeah. uh, an evolutionist needs. Oh, no. We heard Ray Cottrell one time do an afternoon session on this very subject. It's very interesting. He said in the Syriac, there's about 3,000 more years. Yeah. If you went father, son down, mentions people that we don't have in our King James. Yeah. Yeah, there's a difference. It's the three oldest translations or, or oldest versions are the Hebrew, which was original, the Syriac and the Greek, and they they are different by hundreds of years on those first few years. And did Ellen White comment they, about that? About no. six thousand years. She, she she frequently talks about because that's what people believed in her. Well, that's common knowledge at that yeah. time. Yeah. So it is clear that if God created in the beginning, He must have existed before that. And, of course, the same verses, Genesis 1, 1 and 2, John 1, 1 to 4, and Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, make it clear that all three members of the Godhead were together when they said, let us make man in our image, NKJV, Genesis 1, 26. The Bible repeatedly and in different ways states that we are the creation of God. If correctly interpreted, science will not contradict the biblical record. So why do you think the New Testament repeatedly says that Jesus was the agent in creation? He was the Word. Yeah. He was the Word. God spoke and it was so, commanded and it was stood fast, so there's some relationship there. Yeah. So what does it actually mean to us to know that we are the children of God? And you know, I like Luke 3. It goes back and back and back and back. It says, and Seth was the son of Adam, was the son of God. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Unfortunately, in recent times, people have tried to turn Creation Week into something non-literal, such as a metaphor or a parable or even a myth. We, to be honest, if we, and you should know this if you're talking to some of your evolutionary friends or not, people have questions about the Bible. When they say a myth, they're not suggesting that it's completely false. They're, a myth to these kind of people means that these are stories that were made up to, to teach truth. The stories aren't really true, but they're made to teach truths. By contrast, what does the Bible say about creation? What kind of days are being referred to in Genesis 1? Jackie? This is Genesis chapter 1, verse 3 to 5. Then God commanded, Let there be light, and light appeared. God was pleased with what he saw. Then he separated the light from the darkness, and he named the light day and the darkness night. Evening passed and morning came. That was the first day. Wow. Very simple, right? And there's another comment about Exodus that. And then Exodus 20, verse 8 to 11. Observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. You have six days in which to do your work. But the seventh day is a day of rest, dedicated to me. On that day, no one is to work, neither you, your children, your slaves, your animals, nor the foreigners who live in your country. In six days, I, the Lord, made the earth, the sky, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, I rested. That is why I, the Lord, blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Now, for those who want to make the days of creation about a thousand years each, you need to work for 6,000 years before you can rest. 
I wonder how many would like that kind of arrangement. Mm. <laughs> how is it that 1,000? If it's 1,000, maybe it should be 1 million. Well, so. the, the, the people who, who try to make this the seven days, 1,000 years each, they read over in the New Testament, in the, in the eyes of the Lord, a day One is a day. Thousand, is equal to 1,000 years. And there's no, no relationship between those two. This, uh, you know, you, you use Good News Bible, and I was wondering, so, so beautifully translated, this passage. I wonder the gentleman who did it claims... It was, it was a large committee from different so churches. The, the large, large committee from different churches really believe what they just put so beautifully well, together? Yes. they not necessarily believed it, but they believed that that's what the authors wrote. Their, go their goal wasn't to say, what do I want to believe here? Their goal was to say, what does the original language say? Oh, well, Wouldn't that be nice? Maybe they did us a beautiful blessing yeah. to uh, hear this in such a beautiful way. Because I memorized King James Version, yeah. but this beautifully put together. But even a thousand years for a day doesn't uh, uh, help the evolutionists. They no. need long, long No, no, no. Uh, they need a million years or something like that. Even that would not work. How do you handle the DNA, you know, and all the uh, no. changes that they have to have? Okay, Charles, I think you've yes, got sir. <clears throat> word. The Hebrew word for yom, or day, is used consistently throughout the creation narrative for a literal day. Nothing in Genesis creation narrative indicates that anything other than a literal day was meant. As we understand a single day today, in fact, some scholars who don't believe the days were literal will nevertheless admit that the author's intention was to depict literal day. Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for March, Monday, May the 18th. Yeah, that's important. The people, the people who take the language seriously will say whether it's true or not, the author and the, whoever wrote it down intended for it to be literal days. God himself des designated that the first day included evening and morning. The terms are in the singular, never plural. Furthermore, talking about the other days of the week, they are named using cardinal numbers, that is, first, second, third, fourth, etc., there is no suggestion that these days are separated by any kind of gaps or extended for long periods of time. They'll for, criticize that because the sun doesn't appear till the fourth day, so how they would say can yeah. there be. But all you need is a rotating planet and a source of life. Exactly. Of light, so. And the light was created on the first day. Right. So it was there, and there was evening, and there was morning uh, one day. So... We could speculate more about that, but it would be speculation. Oh, yeah, you can speculate mm -hmm. all over the place, yeah. <laughs> For those who have questions about God's ability to create humans in one day, we are reminded that, quote, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, God will recreate all the righteous dead before taking them to heaven. How many million years is that going to take? Hmm. How long does it take you to twinkle your eye? How does this fit with the idea that God took millions of years through some process of theistic evolution to create us in the first place? I think there's some kind of a contradiction there. Well, you could argue that an all-powerful God could have done it any way he wanted to, but the question is, would a God of love have done it that way? Yeah. Through millions and millions of years of suffering, death, disease, and all of those things. Uh, you, and. And if you do that, then, of course, there's no way you can say that sin led to death. Right. It, you would have to have death way billions of years before there was any sin. One only has to look around in our world to realize that the Seventh-day Sabbath is under heavy attack. Many European countries are now de de designated Monday as the first day of the week and Sunday as the seventh day. That's interesting because the Romance languages, French and Spanish and Italian, etc., the word for Sabbath, the word for Saturday is Sabado, or different versions of that. Also Korean, I, I was at a, uh, somebody's house and there were people from Germany and 
a gal uh, is attending La Sierra. She was in Korea, and she said that the seventh day falls on what we would call Sunday in their mm -hmm. their calculations. So, yeah. so wow. there's some disconnect there. The Roman Catholic Church, in a recent papal encyclical, called the Seventh Day Sabbath the Jewish Sabbath, while encouraging the world to observe a day of rest to alleviate global warming. That's from Saint Francis, Pope, uh, Pope Francis. I'm sorry, Pope Francis Laudate Si, yes. Vatican City, and that was in 2015. The Sabbath is a common theme throughout Scripture, and I don't need to tell any of you out there that have any familiarity with Scripture. But some typical places would be Genesis 2, 1 to 3, where the Sabbath, and so the whole universe, I'm reading now, was completed. By the seventh day, God finished what he had been doing and stopped working. He blessed the seventh day and set it apart as a special day because by that day he had completed his creation and stopped working. And that is how the universe was created. Uh, Mark 2, 27 and 28, and Jesus concluded the Sabbath was made for the good of human beings. They were not made for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And Revelation 14 to 7, of course, he said in a loud voice, Honor God and praise his greatness for the time has come for him to judge. Worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. So... There are three important words used to describe the seventh-day Sabbath in Genesis 1 and 2. God rested, he blessed, and then he made it holy or set it apart. And you can read that in Genesis 1, 22 and 28 in chapters 2, verses 2 and 3. No other day in the Bible receives those designations. Why do you think the Sabbath has become such an issue? Why is it that in the three angels' messages in Revelation 14, 6, and 7, we are called to worship God because he was creator? So if you want to do away with that idea, what do you do? You would have to attack the day in which we celebrate his creatorship, right? Right. Uh, what other issues are discussed in the first 11 chapters of Genesis that is a major issue today? These are taken from Wednesday, this week's lesson, May 20. On Wednesday, comment from our study guide, the last decade has witnessed enormous changes in the way society and governments define marriage. Many nations of the world have approved same-sex marriages, overturning previous laws that have protected the family structure that comprises at its center one man and one woman. This is an unprecedented development in many respects and it raises new questions about the institution of marriage, the relationship of church and state, and the sanctity of marriage and the family as defined in Scripture. So what does God say about the ideal relationship in marriage? This comes from Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Then God said, And now we will make human beings. They will be like us and resemble us. They will have power over the fish, the birds, and all the animals, the domestic, domestic and wild, large and small. So God created human beings, making them to be like himself. He created them male and female, blessed them and said, Have many children so that your descendants will live all over the earth and bring it under their control. I am putting you in charge over the fish, the birds, and all the wild animals. This comes from the Good News Bible. And in Genesis 2, 18, 21 to 23, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to live alone. I will make a suitable companion to help him. Then the Lord made the man fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took out of the man's, out of the man's ribs and closed up the flesh. Margaret, I'm going to interrupt you for just a little bit. You know a little bit about putting people to sleep? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> How much anesthesia would it take to take a rib out of a man? Quite a bit. Yeah. Quite a bit. That's why the Bible says what? Deep sleep. <laughs> a deep and sleep. as a side issue, you know, we were talking about interpretation. I met a guy once who saw this and he said, you know, it doesn't say that he woke him up. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> so therefore, his ex existential view was that all of this is part of Adam's dream. I see. We're still part of Adam's dream, huh? Exactly. <laughs> so none of this is real. Sorry, Margaret, but I had to end it up there. Uh, that's okay. So, yeah, anyway, he took, he took one, one of the man's ribs and closed up the flesh. He formed a woman out of the rib and brought her to him. Then the man said, at last, here is one of my own kind, bone taken from my bone and flesh from my flesh. Woman is her name because she was taken out of man. And that's also from the Good News Bible. Um, when you think about this, I mean, all of the intricate things that go along with this, it's just not how God made us. That's just amazing. Yes, and amazing, yeah. Why did God bother to, I mean, he could have made Eve out of more clay. He could have, there's lots of things he could have done. Why do you suppose he took a bone? I mean, if you really... He could have just spoken the word. I mean, that's, he could have just spoken that's what's the word. going to happen when we get to the resurrection. In one instant, he just speaks the word and you're recreated like yeah. you were originally supposed to be. Yeah. So he doesn't come down and form us out of mud anymore. It's just a word. Well, some have suggested that men are superior to women, obviously. And the reason is because Eve was taken out of Adam. But every woman who has given birth to a child should respond jokingly, I hope, by saying that every male since that day has been taken out of woman. True. <laughs> <laughs> well, left to ourselves, uh, it seems to me that sometimes the search for equality becomes the search for superiority. Oh, yes. Uh, it becomes a lot of infighting. It can, as Ellen White says, they could no longer live in harmony so mm -hmm. one had to be subjected or the other. She implies that it could have been either one. Mm -hmm. So it's not about ability. No. But she says Eve was subjected because of her part in the whole thing. So, But it still comes down to we have to submit to one another. If we don't and love each God. other and submit to one another, we can't really uh, carry out the way things are supposed to be in the kingdom of God. It's important for us to notice that the three members of the Godhead in a loving relationship with each other chose to create us male and female with that intended same loving relationship. And I, uh, I, I have a, a notion that I think is biblically based and also on the writings of Ellen White. Someday we're planning to go to heaven, all God's faithful people. And we're going to have to live with people not just all of the people of our generation, not with just a husband and a wife, or a husband or a wife, depending which side we are. We have to live with people from all kinds of generations, from every culture and so forth. So living with someone who doesn't think exactly like you do would be good practice. For I think that's exactly why. God, and then we've got to raise our kids. I mean, what an experience it is to, to, to understand God's problems, to struggle with your own kids. Um, hmm. I, anyway. But the Lord has given us specific guidelines to follow. It was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Yeah. You see, so uh, even it's creeping into the church today and, and it is very sad. You see, the, the Lord says, this is how it's going to be. Oh, a man is not going to look down or treat the uh, lady in in a different way mother is the one who who is really truly in charge of raising the kids mm -hmm. how many men have a chance to you know so i mean the specific job has been given to specific people and it, it just hurts me that places and leaders are trying to twist and turn things yeah. it cannot be that way so in the last decade or so, there's been a huge movement to make homosexual relationships acceptable legally and morally. Now, I think we as Christians need to recognize that God loves everybody. We're, we have a real problem. We tend to hate the sinner and love the sin. Uh, God says, love the sinner and hate the sin. Uh, so... I think we need to be as considerate as we possibly can of everybody, no matter what their 
what their particular problems are. Uh, that doesn't mean we have to think that what they do is correct. I mean, we should not think that the sins of anybody, I'm not happy about the sins that I do. I mean, I shouldn't be, I hope. And yeah. God... Huh? Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Finish your thought. Well, God's original intention was obviously for one man to be mixed with, to put together with one woman. And God intended for that relationship to result in children. Having children is a very important educational experience for human beings. Yes. We're all born apart from God. So and the only hope for over. any of us is to, be, is to be born again. We just exhibit our fallenness in different ways. Uh, yeah. Some of it more socially acceptable than others. Yeah. But that still doesn't get us off the hook. We, we must be born again. Well, Jesus himself made some very clear statements about human marriage. Matthew 19, 3 to 6. Some Pharisees came to him and asked, excuse me, and tried to trap him by asking, does our law allow a man to divorce his wife for whatever reason he wishes? Jesus answered, haven't you read the scriptures that says that in the beginning the Creator made people male <coughs> and female? And God said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and unite with his wife, and the two will become one. So, they are no longer two, but one. No human being must separate then, excuse me, no human being must separate then what God has joined together. Good News Bible. I, for those who aren't so familiar with the setting here. Who is it that comes and, comes and raises this question? The Pharisees. Mm -hmm. Who is it that claims to have the Bible memorized? Or the Pharisees. The Pharisees. And what does Jesus say? <laughs> Haven't you read the Bible? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I'm sure the people listening in must have... <laughs> Haven't you read the Bible? Hmm. So, there are little, little hints all the way through here. God had a fabulous sense of humor. So he, they came back at him with, then why did Moses give us a uh, uh, right that we should give us a, yeah. a certificate of divorce? And Jesus yeah. said, because of the hardness of your heart. Um, God wanted something better for them, but they, yep. they wouldn't bend. Well, God sees everything from beginning to end. History has given us an unbroken link between the perfect creation, the fall, the promised Messiah in the middle of human history, what he did while on this earth, and the final redemption. And the verses, um, well, we can look at a few of these. Genesis 131, God looked at everything he had made and he was very pleased. Evening passed and morning came, that was the sixth day. And then you go to Genesis 2, 15 to 17. Then the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and guard it. He said to him, you may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. And Genesis 3, 1 to 7, we know what Satan did with that. Now, the snake was the most cunning animal that the Lord God had made. Now, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to going, getting to heaven. And one of the things, I, how, what, was, what was cunning about the serpent, about the snake? Presumably, we'll have cunning snakes when we get to heaven, right? Is that into translation? Yeah, that's what I wonder about. We use the word, but what did the original say? I, I probably should have looked that up and tried to figure it out, but the word cunning is kind of an odd word. Yeah. It, he was sneaky. As well, sneaky. Deception. I mean, yeah, was, well, was... Maybe he was smarter. the wisest. He was, smiser, wise. he was smarter than the others. Yeah. Or. Well, Islam has a god, that he sees a great trickster. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's, of course, if you're dealing with uh, non... If a Muslim is dealing with a non-Jew, excuse me, a non-Muslim, they don't have to uh, honor their agreements. They don't even have to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, 
The snake asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat fruit from any tree in the garden? I'm sure he said, really? No, in whatever language he was speaking. <clears throat> we may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, the woman answered, except the tree in the middle of it. God told us not to eat the fruit of that tree or even to touch it. If we do, we will die. The snake replied, that's not true. You will not die. God said that. And of course, meanwhile, what's he doing? He's chomping on the apple, right? Um, it was a mango. Was it a mango? Yeah. Maybe so. <laughs> God said that because he knows that when you eat it, you will be like God and know what is good and what is bad. The woman saw how beautiful the tree was and how good its fruit would be to eat, and she thought how wonderful it would be to become wise. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband. He also ate it. As soon as they had eaten it, they were given understanding. Now they were wise. Mm -hmm. And realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and covered themselves. Wow. The word that's used there uh, can be translated subtle, shrewd, yeah. crafty, sly, sensible, uh, even prudent. Uh, but it's God who word. created. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is so maybe prudent. Well, and, and, cunning, cunning is. And um, remember that these, these snakes could fly. Yes. Um, Crafty, yeah. But well, it may be, uh, you know, again the trouble of translation. It may be it, with Satan imbuing this this serpent uh, yeah. with his presence may have yeah. created that uh, those characteristics. Yeah. Well, this is an incredibly sad story. God's perfect creation was spoiled. And the results have continued to cause all kinds of problems in our day from that day, in our world, from that day to this. There's no question about the fact that there was nothing faulty about God's original creation that might have caused sin to happen, neither in the creation of Lucifer up in heaven, nor in the creation of Adam and Eve. And God created that beautiful Garden of Eden, which was supposed to be our eternal home. There was no taint of sin or shadow of death. Adam and Eve had regular access to the tree of life. They were warned not to eat of that other tree. We already read that. But as we know, it happened. Paul commented about the fall as recorded in Romans. Reading from Romans 5 verse 12. Sin came into the world through one man and his sin brought death with it. As a result, death has spread to the whole human race because everyone has sinned. Romans 6.23, For sin pays its wage, death. But God's free gift is eternal life in union with Christ Jesus our Lord. And that comes from the Good News Bible. If we were to accept theistic evolution or even Darwinian evolution, then Paul's writings have no meaning. There would have been no time when men first sinned. And what would be the reason for calling Christ the second Adam if there was no first Adam? Well, look at 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 47. For the scripture says the first man, Adam, was created a living being, but the last Adam is a life-giving spirit. It is not the spiritual that comes first, but the physical and then the spiritual. The first Adam made of earth came from the earth. The second Adam came from heaven. So what do we learn from Genesis in, in this lesson? This is from the... Uh Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Friday, May 22. The cumulative evidence based on comparative, literary, linguistic, and other considerations converges on every level, leading to the singular conclusion that the designation Yom, day, in Genesis 1 means consistently a literal 24-hour day. The author of Genesis 1 could not have produced more comprehensive and all-inclusive ways to express the idea of a literal day than the ones that were chosen. That's Gerhard F. Hassel, the days of creation in Genesis 1, literal days or figurative periods of time in the book Origins, 1994. Okay. Jackie? And then this is Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, Ellen D. White. The greatest minds, if not guided by the Word of God, become bewildered in their attempts 
to investigate the relations of science and revelation. The Creator and His works are beyond their comprehension, and because these cannot be explained by natural laws, Bible history is pronounced unreliable. Yeah, it's um, incredible. I mean, we set up standards which we think are somehow very, very reliable and so forth like this, and these are often based on science, and then we say, okay, well, the Bible doesn't fit our standards, so therefore it can't be relied on. Yeah. Well, today each of us is faced with a serious challenge. So-called science comes up with ideas which seem to, contradict, seem to contradict the biblical account. What are we supposed to do when faced with such conflicts? Remember that science, let's, let's be very clear on this, this, is a really important point. Science is based on the idea that one does something by experiment which she or he can repeat again and again under the same circumstances and she or he will get the same results. That's, exact, that's what science means. You do the same thing and then somebody else does it. If I do some experiment, then Dennis can do that experiment under the same conditions and he should get the same results. Well, what happens? Are we, are we gonna, is God going to let us recreate the world a half a dozen times to see if we can repeat what happened before? And obviously, one-time events just don't fit with these definitions of science. I mean, but he has allowed us to recreate because we, when we have children, yes. the miracle of that child, I, I have never seen a mother who has delivered a child who hasn't been just amazed. Not that they would be the best mom later on, but at the time, mm -hmm. they're amazed. One-time events, such as the creation of our world, cannot be repeated again and again and thus are criticized by scientists. So what about the theory of evolution? How many times has that happened? Well, they would, uh, there's macro and micro evolution, but they don't yeah. want to make that distinction. They want yeah. to take things that uh, are just natural adaptations and call those um, evolution. evolution and then extrapolate that backward and say, well, then it, these other things must have happened too. Uh, but mostly it's about stories. They tell stories about how uh, if you give enough time, which is just their uh, well, out of the gap explanation of things, uh, then what is, um, see, how do they say that? Uh, what, what is impossible becomes possible. Given enough what, time. What, what's possible becomes probable and what is probable becomes certain. So, but that's a philosophical. It's left science yeah. behind back at what is impossible. Yeah. So, uh, but it's a persuasive ar ar argument if you want to believe it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Jackie goes to sleep, and uh, given enough time, when she wakes up, her hair is going to be perfectly in place. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Isn't that what? Oh, that's exactly how it happens. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. right. Oh. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> should we seriously accept the idea presented in Scripture that there is a relationship among Adam's sin, his later death, the plan of salvation, which resulted in the death of Jesus Christ on the cross? Mm -hmm. Scripture seems to say so. Mm -hmm. Scripture seems to say so. Mm -hmm. As Seventh-day Adventist Christians, should we have questions about the authenticity of these accounts early in the book of Genesis? Should we? Is, is it, it all right to question? Is it possible that the Lord himself wrote the first 11 verses of Genesis chapter 1? That would be hard to question. Well, well, in fact, God wants us to question. He doesn't want us to doubt, but he wants us to question, to find out as far as possible what information is available to sure, us. He says, uh, Come now, let us reason together. Reasoning yeah, that's is a lovely text. Beautiful. beautiful. That is beautiful. Yeah. That's what he says. Yeah. Come, we'll, we'll talk. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and if you look at the places where angels or God himself appeared to human beings, I mean, there's, right. to Moses and to, and to Ezekiel and to Joshua and to John, Revelation, and so forth, 
You know, as soon as they see God's glory, they're collapsing face down on the mud. God, what does God always say? Stand up, I want to talk to you. Yeah, yeah. don't be Communion. afraid, fear yeah. not. Yeah. Yeah. Communion. Yeah, exactly. That's important. Well, Our problem is we don't listen very well. <laughs> so now, then in light of all that, how should we relate to evolutionists, even theistic evolutionists? Can I... Can Yes. My husband has written in the margin here, love them all. <laughs> That's an excellent one. What, what was well, Billy Graham? I, I was, I was, what gave rise to that, there was a, an expression that was born back during the Inquisition when uh, uh, this inquisitor was sent after some heretics. Mm -hmm. And he knew that they were in this city, but there were good Catholics there too. And so he wondered what to do, the general did. So he asked somebody and they said, uh, kill them all and let God sort them out. <laughs> and that <laughs> phrase has come down uh, even to, I think Marines use a similar uh, idea. But I think it would be good for us, you know, because sometimes when we don't like somebody or mm. we're at mm. odds with them, we think, well, what, how should we do? What, what should we do? And I think what we should do is we should love them all and let God sort them out. Yeah. Yeah. So how should we relate to those who question the necessity of sticking to God's definition of marriage, for example? We know that God has done every, I'm sorry, we know that Satan has done everything he possibly can to discredit God, to destroy God's reputation, to encourage doubts about God's word. We have suggested in this lesson that those first 11 chapters of Genesis are foundational to everything else we read in Scripture. Should it be any surprise that Satan has done everything possible to destroy our confidence in that account? Should faithful Christians be raising questions about the reliability and truthfulness of Genesis? If we don't, guess who will? Now, that doesn't mean we, we, we need to say, well, it's not reliable, but we need to ask those questions and we need to think about them and we need to come up with answers because sooner or later, those questions are going to come to us. So we need to ask ourselves, why do we choose to believe those first 11 chapters of Genesis? Is that, is that a rational thing to do or are we off in another world somewhere? But we are dealing with the reality, you see. Could it just happen? Could the earth be placed in exact spot mm -hmm. that if it were this way or that way, life could not be possible? Could it just happen? Yeah. Well, it's important to notice that these first 11 chapters of Genesis answer the existential questions for all men and women. What are the existential questions? What questions have challenged the thinking of human beings from the beginning until our day? One, where did I come from? Where am I Two, going? who am I? Three, why am I here? What is the purpose and meaning of life? Where am I going? What happens to me after I die? I mean, there's a, we've sort of expanded what often people understand there, but... Those are the questions, and they have been raised by so many people under so many different circumstances. But they, those are things we need to, we need to struggle. And God is the only one who's given us a total package in which it, we can come out with consistent answers that, that are reliable. Okay, I think Charles, you're next. Before we were created in the beginning, there was God. He designed an ecosystem for us creating the habitation of earth perfectly for his new creatures in order to sustain life. Our earth is located at a precise distance from the sun, not too far, not too close. The sun is perfectly sized so as not to produce too much energy to destroy life. There is abundant water on earth and uh, breathable atmosphere. The moon is just the right size to control the tides. The magnetic field is fine-tuned to keep us from getting fried by the sun. No wonder that after every stage of creation, God concludes 
that it is good. Tov, mm -hmm. Genesis 1, 4, 10, 18, 21, 25. And when it was completed after the Sabbath, I just added that. Mm -hmm. Tov, Menod, very good, Genesis 1, 31. Adults, uh, Teacher's Sabbath School uh, Study Guide, page 107. I hope someday we'll get a chance to sort of watch God recreate. And, uh, you know, I, I would like someday to see, I'm sure the Godhead sat down and said, okay, how can we make this perfect environment? Because at that point in time, if we believe God knows the future, he says, that's going to be my future home. That's going to be my future headquarters. Yes. Make it just right. It's going to be right here. And they, are, they knew the, the laws of, gen, of, of gravity. Well, I shouldn't say. They made the laws of gravity. Yes. So it would work exactly <laughs> right. They made everything. And they, they made the things that would fit. I mean, think of all the, all, everything that had to be worked out for all these things to be true. Just mind-boggling. Well, when we deal with the macro creation and micro creation, we have 70 trillion cells in our bodies. Mm -hmm. How do they work together yeah. as a team? Yeah. It's amazing. Amazing. Evolutionists are having more and more trouble trying to explain their model of how things came about by mere chance. And books are coming out right and left. I mean, I shouldn't say right and left, quite a few that are just tearing Darwinian evolution into pieces. I'm reading one right now called Darwin Devolves. Devolves. <laughs> Devolves. Okay, Jim, I think. There's a real interesting bit of commentary from the teacher's study guide of our Sabbath School lesson around 107. The human cell is made up of the tiniest of machines that in order to function must have all their parts. Like a mousetrap, you take one part away and the device ceases to function. Each cell contains, contains a person's DNA. A computer is based on binary code of zeros and ones. DNA is made up of a quaternary code, four parts, A, C, G, and T which is far more complex than a binary code. And let me interrupt for just a second. There are people working very hard to try to figure out how they can, they can make a quaternary code that they could do, put, put, in, put, in, put into computers. And they're, they're not even close yet. An entire language with grammar and syntax is associated with DNA. With three billion bases, moreover, this DNA can replicate itself, and it does so within nearly 40 trillion cells. Boy, who counts all that in the human <laughs> That's a body? That's a good question. I mean, I, people make these statements, and I'm saying, how do they ever come up <laughs> counting 40 trillion cells? What they do um, is they take a minuscule part of each organ in the body and they count the cells and right. then they multiply it. It, it sounds, sounds like politicians in a way. <laughs> <laughs> Each of the 200 types of the cells in the human body, that was interesting to me, 200 different types of yeah. cells in the human body has a different function. These are the core building blocks of life and they work in harmony to, harmony to carry out the basic functions for a human being to survive. Certainly, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. The Amen. complexity and the commonality among all human beings and living creatures point to a single creator who designed life. But we are not simply machines. We have been given a creative mind, a conscience, and an ability to experience love, hope, and happiness. The conscience of the human mind and the freedom we have to choose and to create are impossible to explain from an evolutionary perspective. How much easier to believe in a creator who created us in his image and in his likeness. I have to tell you a story from my experiences in Africa. I had the privilege of uh, working with a group of high-level biologists that 
their specialty was large mammals. And they were there researching the mammals and so forth. And I used to go down with them and they would take me around the game park and we used to walk out there among the lions and the elephants and the giraffes and all those kinds of things and so forth. And one day I had a very serious conversation with one of them. And this guy was a Christian, but he was also an evolutionist. And he asked me in all seriousness, he says, where do you think in the evolutionary process God inserted a soul? Yeah. That's an interesting question, really. Yeah. I, I was... Huh. Inserted a soul. Well, see, if, if <laughs> you believe the soul is what gets to be, what gets saved at the end, yeah, you don't, you know, all those creatures back there in the yeah. process, yeah, they're not going to be saved. At what point does God did God insert a soul? And I was just taken back by the question. What did you I, tell him? Well, I stumbled around for a while. <laughs> I would. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of my, my co-workers maintained that that was the Roman Catholic position. She, mm -hmm. she was a Roman Catholic and had a master's in, in theology also. So that at some point, God put the soul in mm -hmm. uh, a creature. And, and of course, they, the human being, they, they, you know, of course, they have the Greek idea of the ghost in the machine, you know, that the soul inhabits the body, but it... Uh, when the body dies, the soul goes somewhere else. So mm -hmm. uh, that's that's in their paradigm and their way of thinking. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh, in the Bible, it tells us where the soul came from. Oh, where did the information come from? Was it before the soul or after the soul? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> well. We're running out of time. Margaret, after creating a perfect ecosystem for us, God determined that Humanity was to live in communion with God and with each other. God designed that both male and female were to be biologically, physically, and emotionally the counterpart to each other. They were created to complement each other. They were the perfect fit for each other, and so that Adam could ex exclaim when Eve was later designed from his rib, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, Genesis 23. 223. Thus, Adam names her woman. Marriage requires that a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. It's Genesis 2.24, teaches, adult teacher's Sabbath school lesson guide. Seventh-day Adventists believe that the first four commandments are focused on our relationship with God, while the last six are focused on our relationship with our fellow human beings. It is interesting to notice that after the Sabbath commandment, the next thing that is mentioned is the fifth commandment in which we are to honor our father and mother. God intended for us to live in a world of perfect peace and harmony with loving families who regard God supremely and raise their children in humble obedience. But sin destroyed all of that. Satan has done everything possible to drive wedges between us and God and between us and those around us. I recently was overheard a conversation about uh, someone I knew many, many years ago that decided that he didn't want to be a man anymore, he wanted to be a woman. And all of his family and friends are, you know, tried to adjust themselves to this idea, but he already had children. And these friends were commenting, you know, the children have a bad hard time because they're not quite sure whether to call him dad or mom. <laughs> we have a friend we like that. We have a friend like that. <laughs> and it's not easy. Well, no, it's not easy. Uh, when Jesus comes back, each one of his faithful children will be able to experience something of God's creative power when we are recreated. Try to imagine that day. Jesus pointed his hearers back to the marriage institution as ordained at creation. Then marriage and the Sabbath had their origin, twin institutions for the glory of God and in, in the benefit of humanity. Then, as the Creator joined the hands of the holy pair in wedlock, saying, A man shall leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one. Genesis 2.24 He enunciated the law of marriage for all of the children of Adam to the close of time. Can I interrupt there for just a second? 
we know that God put Adam in this deep sleep. He took out the rib. He made Eve out of it. And Adam woke up. What did he think when, the first, when he first saw his wife? Well, what, what did he say? Well, remember that he, he's already, according to the Bible story, he's already had all the animals come before him. Right. And the Bible, the language there says he gave them names right. appropriate for what they look like and so forth like this. So now he's, he's, he's probably thinking, okay, God, I, I need to name this creature. Wow. You know, oh, woman, I guess. That would be appropriate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is now bone of my bones and flesh, and flesh of my flesh. Of my flesh. She yeah. shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Yep. Amazing. Okay, Jim, sorry. That which the Eternal Father himself had pronounced good was the law of highest blessing and development for man. Ellen White, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, pages 63 and 64. We recognize that this lesson has a lot of ideas in it that uh, challenge people's thinking and, and, and don't go, go along with a lot of people's lifestyles and so forth in our day. Um, we, to be honest, those who have, those of us who take the scripture seriously, look at those things and we, we, it, they trouble us. They wonder, we wonder why these things are happening. And while we love those who are mixed up in these kind of relationships, um, we, we have to think that based on what it says in scripture, um, this was not God's original plan. So this lesson has proved to be a challenge to many who are still struggling with some of the issues we have discussed. And we would ask you out there, do you have any questions about all of these things we've talked about here? Uh, and you must have. I mean, almost everybody, if you have someone who's involved in any of these things, you must have some questions about it. Think about what God says and think about what relationship you want to have to all those people and the kind of relationship that God already has with them. Our loving Father, what a privilege it is to be your children. Yes. We know what the original plan was. You spell it out quite specifically. Uh, the days we are to worship, the kind of people we are supposed to be, the way we are supposed to reproduce our children, all of that was part of your plan. Help us to know how we can best relate to those who somehow don't feel like they're a part of that overall plan. Help us to love them and hopefully bring them into your kingdom if it's your will, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.